Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our webinar on Choosing IVF and Surrogacy, Journey to Parenthood. Now, before we begin, I just want to go over a few things. Um, everyone is in listen-only mode this evening. If you have questions throughout this presentation, you can enter those questions in the control panel, go to webinar. And we're going to be keeping all of these questions to the end of the presentation just to keep the flow um, moving along. And we are recording this webinar tonight, and each of you will be receiving a, um, a copy, just in case you, for some reason, um, have to go early tonight. Now, you'll be hearing from Dr. Mira Shaw, MD, who's a reproductive endocrinology and fertility specialist at Nova IVF in Mountain View, California, along with my colleague, Angela Rastegar, who is the director of our West Coast and Asia Pacific. Um, she's actually the director of our West Coast office in San Francisco. And tonight um, we'll be talking about, so you'll hear a little bit of um, NOVA fertility, indi indications for IVF, the review of the IVF process and timeline, um, outcomes based on age, when to consider using an egg donor and a surrogate. And then Dr. Shaw will hand it over to my colleague, Angela, who will do a quick introduction of circle surrogacy and egg donation. And then she will be talking about the surrogacy and egg donation process and timeline, and then we'll open it up to questions. Now to get it started, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Shaw. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. So today I'm gonna to be going over IVF, egg donation, and surrogacy, which is clearly covering a lot of content. So we're just gonna be scratching the surface and we'll leave some time at the end for some questions. And you're welcome to reach out to me after today's session for any follow-up questions as well. Take the next slide. So IVF has been around for a little over 40 years and the most common indication for IVF is infertility, which affects about one in eight couples. So it's very common and is often linked to a decline in both egg quality and egg supply. Some women also have a tuple factor condition in which their fallopian tubes are blocked, either because of a prior infection or surgery or infl inflammation. And so that renders them difficult to conceive naturally. Male factor is also quite common. It affects about one third of all the couples that we see. And that could be due to a number of different factors that result in low sperm motility or morphology or concentration. Some women also have a diminished ovarian reserve, and that's related to both genetic and environmental factors. We do know that smoking can accelerate the decline in egg supply. Many women start their fertility journey with treatments like IUI because it is less invasive and less costly. But after trying three to six cycles of IUI, if they're unsuccessful, oftentimes IVF is their next step. Uterine factor includes a host of different conditions which make it difficult for women to carry a pregnancy. These could include conditions such as the presence of uterine fibroids or a condition called Asherman syndrome in which there's scarring in the uterus that makes it very difficult for them to successfully carry a pregnancy. Some women also have recurrent miscarriages, often due to chromosomal abnormalities. And so IVF can be used to genetically test embryos to reduce the risk of a subsequent miscarriage. IVF can also be used to test embryos for specific genetic conditions, wherein if either parent is a known carrier for a single gene condition, for example, cystic fibrosis, we can test embryos to identify if the embryo would be affected and then opt not to transfer those embryos to improve the success rate of the cycle. Lastly, for same-sex couples, IVF is a great option for family planning. This includes for same-sex female couples who are interested in reciprocal IVF, wherein one woman will be the egg donor to create the embryos, which will then be transferred into her partner. And then of course, for same-sex male couples, they will be in need of both an egg donor and a gestational carrier. Take the next slide, please. So the IVF process begins with a woman taking IVF hormones, and those include injectable hormones that a woman will self-administer, typically in the lower abdominal area. They're very, very easy to administer and have very minimal side effects. 
and she'll do them daily for on average 10 to 12 days. During this period of time, she will undergo a series of transvaginal ultrasounds to monitor the progress of her ovarian follicle growth. Below, you can see a picture of a stimulated ovary. These are follicles, each containing one egg. And as the size of the follicle grows, the egg inside of each follicle is maturing as well. And when it reaches a certain size threshold, the egg is retrieved from the ovary. So typically, at the culmination of the IVF cycle, a woman will administer a trigger injection, and then 36 hours later, she will undergo an egg retrieval. Typically, this procedure is done under sedation, and typically, the physician will place a transvaginal ultrasound and a needle through the vaginal sidewall into the ovary to suction out each of the follicle fluid to extract the egg. Then the embryologist will harvest the eggs and fertilize them with the sperm and create the embryos. And about two weeks later, a woman will have a menstrual period and all her physiology will return back to normal. Subsequent to the IVF cycle, a woman will then undergo an embryo transfer cycle. It takes about six to eight weeks of hormone preparation to do that. And um, if the embryo transfer is successful, then typically the woman will undergo pregnancy monitoring with her IVF clinic. Take the next slide, please. So this is a really nice schematic that was uh, created by a colleague of mine which makes the point that IVF is a pyramid in terms of the attrition that you see at every step of the process. At the base of the pyramid, you see the number of follicles or eggs that a woman produces per cycle. And this is very unique to each individual woman. But not every single one of those follicles is always going to grow. And not all those, those follicles are going to yield an egg at the time of an egg retrieval. So that's the first big step of attrition in the process of, the process of IVF. After the eggs are retrieved, only about 75% of mature eggs will fertilize, and of those, 50% will make it to the blastocyst stage, which is the day five or day six stage of development. And of those, depending on a woman's age, a certain percentage of them will be genetically normal. And the 65% of genetically normal embryos typically results in a live birth. So as you can see, the success rate of this uh, IVF process really depends on both a woman's age, because that's really going to determine the percentage of genetically normal embryos, but also how broad or big the base of that pyramid is and how, what her ovarian reserve looks like. And that can be determined in two ways. One is by doing an ultrasound to determine the number of follicles within the ovaries. And two is with a blood test called an AMH or anti-malarian hormone, which can determine a woman's egg supply. I'll take the next slide, please. So IVF outcomes are largely predicted based on a woman's age. And this data is collected from the Society of Assisted Reproductive Technology, or SART. And this is public information that any one of you can access. And nearly all clinics across the United States are reporting their success rates to the SART organization. So you can really compare clinic success rates by just going on their website and looking up the clinics. But on average, this is national data for women under 35, the success rate of one cycle is about 40 to 50%, and that declines by about 10 to 20% every two to three years. So by the time a woman is in her early 40s, the success rate of an IVF cycle is about 10 to 15%, and for a woman over 42, the success rate is now in the single digit numbers. Take the next slide, please. This is a really nice illustration that I took from Fertility IQ, which is an excellent resource to get education on the IVF process. I highly encourage all of you to look at their website because they have some really great evidence-based information. What this graph is illustrating is essentially the number of cycles that a woman undergoes at various ages and the cumulative live birth rate. So the top of the curve shows women under 40 in pink, and as I, you can see that there's really a net gain in the cumulative live birth rate for the first few cycles, but you do start to see a plateau around cycle six or seven. The, the curve of those, um, those uh, growth curves are a little bit more um, you know, flat for women in their 40s and for women, especially over 43. And typically after about three to four cycles, you're not really seeing much of a net increase in the cumulative live birth rate for these women. Which brings me to the next slide, which is essentially for these women who've undergone multiple IVF cycles and unfortunately have not been successful, their next step is often to consider an egg donor. Now, 
the number of cycles to complete before you consider using an egg donor is deeply personal and it's different for every couple. So really this is a conversation that you want to have with your IVF doctor. And it, and it really depends on a number of different factors, including the emotional toll of IVF, the financial implications of IVF, and of course, the success rates of their, uh, their cycles. Now, um, advanced maternal age is the most common indication for egg donation, and a large percentage of women over 40 do use this option, and it is very successful for them. Uh, but even for women under 40 who've undergone multiple failed IVF cycles, they often will consider egg donation at an earlier age as well. Sometimes when we see IVF cycles with very poor egg or embryo quality, despite multiple different types of interventions, for these couples, we will also recommend an egg donor. This includes also women who have diminished ovarian reserve or uh, undergo premature ovarian failure at a very young age. Um, another reason is for couples, again, who have a known genetic condition um, who want to prevent their children from having that genetic condition, so they'll consider using an egg donor as well. And of course, for same-sex male couples, they will require both an egg donor as well as a gestational carrier. This is a, a really great illustration from the START data as well, which really makes the point that essentially using an egg donor across various age groups yields the same success rate. So you're going to essentially have the same success rate at age 30, or 45. And I've actually even had patients who are postmenopausal who were able to get pregnant because really the uterus is able to carry a pregnancy nearly at every age, but it does respond to hormones. So as long as a woman is given the appropriate amount of hormones, she can carry a pregnancy at pretty much any age. Now you can see that in contrast for women who do autologous IVF or they're using their own eggs. This is shown in the green curve. You can see that with advanced maternal age, you're going to see a pretty precipitous decline in outcomes depending on their, their age. I'll take the next slide, please. So now I'd like to briefly go over indications for surrogacy. And the American Society of Reproductive Medicine states that a surrogate is indicated when a true medical condition precludes the intended parent from carrying a pregnancy or would pose a significant risk of death or harm to the woman or the fetus. So some examples of this are the absence of a uterus, a congenital uterine anomaly, or even an acquired uterine anomaly, such as, as I mentioned before, Asherman syndrome or scarring of the uterus. There are some medical conditions that make it an absolute contraindication to carry a pregnancy, such as pulmonary hypertension. And there are also other kinds of conditions like rheumatologic conditions or cardiac conditions that would severely worsen during pregnancy and, and thus would um, necessitate the use of a gestational carrier and finally, if it's biologically um, um, uh, inconceivable to, to have a child, for example, for single um, men or homosexual ma male couples, for them, they will require a decisional carrier as well. So the in the next slide, I wanted to uh, give you a few examples of cases in which we've used a, a gestational carrier at NOVA. Um, I've, I've used this very successfully in couples who have experienced recurrent miscarriages. Um, for anyone who has experienced a miscarriage, this can be extremely psychologically traumatizing and devastating. And for these couples, using a gestational carrier can relieve some of that anxiety going into a subsequent pregnancy. Um, also, I've had patients who've undergone hysterectomy for a variety of indications, but fibroids are one of the most common indications for undergoing hysterectomy. Uh, the third example is for couples who have profound post-traumatic stress disorder from a family member who has had a pregnancy complication. And again, in conjunction with a psychological counselor, a reproductive therapist, um, we are able to justify using a surrogate in these cases. And finally, we have cases of unexplained implantation failure. And for these couples, we are able to ultimately achieve success using a surrogate. Ultimately, this is something that, you know, the physician has to feel comfortable with and the indication has to be clearly documented in the medical records. So that was a really brief overview of IVF, egg donation, and surrogacy. But again, we'll leave some time for questions at the very end. And I'll turn it over to Angela for the second half of the presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Shah. So I'll just talk a little bit about the surrogacy process. Um, feel free to type in questions as we're going, because I know we're covering a lot of information. 
Um, so you can just go ahead to the next slide. I wanted to share a little bit of an overview as to who we are at Circle Surrogacy and Egg Donation. Um, there's a number of surrogacy agencies out there that can help you if you decide to pursue this route. Circle is a full service agency, which means that every part of the journey that you'll need help with is done in-house. If you were to sign on with Circle, we'd take care of everything for you, including providing you with an attorney, except of course for the medical piece of the puzzle, which is what clinics like Dr. Shaw's would take care of. Um, the price of surrogacy can really vary depending on whether or not you need to try multiple transfers, if your carrier has a miscarriage, travel costs, etc. And that can actually be a really stressful piece of this puzzle. So at Circle, we have an exclusive fixed cost program that guarantees a single price for you, which can help you really financially plan and protect your investment. And then perhaps most importantly, one thing that really differentiates us is our personal experience in this field. About 40% of our staff have either been parents through surrogacy, surrogates themselves, egg donors, or um, experienced IVF for adoption. So we really bring that love and care to our process. And as a result, we've had well over 2000 babies born over our 25 years of experience. Um, the other things that are unique about Circle is we really encourage a relationship between parents, carriers, and even egg donors. Um, but especially the parents and carriers will get to know each other and be in contact throughout the journey, which leads to really successful outcomes and is something that attracts a lot of carriers to us. So as a result, we're very, very selective um, amongst the thousands of carrier applicants that come to us each month. We accept only about one or two percent. So I'm just gonna share a quick overview of what the process looks like to give you a little bit of background, and then you can always um, schedule more time to speak with us further. As you can see in this middle bar here, you can plan on your surrogacy journey taking about 18 to 21 months. I know that sounds like a long time, but there's a lot of big steps along the way. So the first is just finding your carrier match. At the moment, that takes about five or six months. We'll be looking for someone that's a perfect fit for you based on location, the relationship you want, personality, et cetera. And for some couples during that time, Dr. Shaw talked about the embryo creation piece. If you're creating your own embryos or working with an egg donor, which we can help provide, that will take about two to four months. So that fits nicely while you're waiting for your carrier match. Um, the second big phase is preparing for the transfer. During that phase, that takes several months because we're gonna be finalizing your legal contracts, your carrier is gonna be preparing for her transfer, and it's kind of a nice opportunity to start building the relationship with your carrier that I mentioned is an important piece of our puzzle. And the pregnancy itself obviously is about nine months. Parents can be as involved as they'd like during that phase, including perhaps visiting a few times. Um, and then lastly, the birth. Uh, usually it only takes a few days for you to be cleared after the birth to travel home with your baby, but we always recommend planning on a few months just in case there's any complications and you might need to stay at the hospital longer. So that's kind of the high level overview. Um, okay, that's the next page. Uh, the other thing I wanted to touch on is just the amount of support that we provide for our intended parents. This can be a lengthy, stressful emotional process as well as logistically complicated. These seven things are our core pillars of our program here at Circle. So we support you with a full team, um, both for you as well as to liaise with all parties that you'll be working with, including your surrogate and your egg donor if you need one. Um, our matching process is very comprehensive and done with multiple people from our team, including social workers and legal professionals. Uh, we take care of everything for your surrogate and egg donor, including her travel, all of her expenses. We handle all payments, insurance, um, and we also help prepare the hospital for your delivery to make sure that you have a really smooth experience. And then lastly, we'll assist with returning home. So really everything's taken care of for you at Circle if you were to join our program. Next page, please. Uh, the last couple of things I wanted to touch on are costs. So as I mentioned, costs can really range for this process. Um, we'll see some agencies advertising much lower amounts where they're not really building in the full potential cost if anything goes wrong. 
So at Circle, we charge one set price for surrogacy only, that's 125,500. And if you include egg donation, it's 149,500, um, which really includes all of those elements of the program that I discussed on the last page. The one thing to keep in mind is additional egg retrievals and transfers are paid a la carte if needed. Um, but you can actually protect against that with the journey protection guarantee. The last section of this slide talks a little bit about this. And for an extra $10,000 more in each of these programs, we will guarantee unlimited transfers, unlimited journeys until um, you bring home a baby. Otherwise, we'll refund 100% of our agency fees and any third party funds that were unused. So we're really excited to be able to offer this. It's very unique and it's something that really can help give you the peace of mind to know that we're gonna stick with you until you get over the finish line. And then lastly, next page, we have recently launched a financing plan to help you cover the costs of surrogacy. It's optional to take this, but we'll extend up to $65,000 in a loan for qualified intended parents, including um, folks who live here in the state of California and a number of other states throughout the country. And you can pay that back either over three years or six years. It's really um, flexible design just for our intended parents to help you um, very seamlessly cover the cost of this program. There's no origination fees set or no, and no prepayment penalties. So we're really excited to be able to offer this. Again, this is a unique program we designed for Circle. And it's been really nice to see um, kind of more intended parents be able to pursue this without such a big financial strain. So with that, um, next page, we just wanna offer, um, if you have any other questions, I know we covered a ton of information in a very rapid pace, and this is a big decision. So we really welcome you to take us up on our offer for um, private virtual consultations. I, uh, as Jen mentioned at the beginning, am based in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have a Burlingame office. We're also down in Los Angeles quite often, and I have colleagues throughout the country that are happy to meet with you, I guess, virtually for now, but hopefully in person one day. Um, Dr. Shaw, do you wanna talk a little bit about your offices as well? Sure, thanks, Angela. So we are based in Mountain View, uh, located near El Camino Hospital. And we are, um, all of our services are in a single facility. So we do all of our medical procedures. The storage of your eggs and embryos would be on site. And I have one partner, um, Dr. Schmidt, so we're a two physician practice at NOVA. And we really do try to specialize in personalized care. We've worked with Circle now in a number of different cases and really have had a really wonderful, positive experience. So we look forward to collaborating with them and more uh, with, for, to help more patients achieve their, their goals and their dreams of family planning. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll wait for questions to come in. Feel free to um, type in any questions. One question that I often get when I speak to intended parents at the start of this process is kind of what is a typical relationship like with their carrier both during and after the pregnancy? And I always say that's really up to you. Um, if you are more of an outgoing kind of open person, we have intended parents and carriers that you know become Instagram friends and are texting continually, others who are a little more private. We always recommend, um, or part of our program is that you have a standing weekly call with your carrier. So Thursday night Zoom, Sunday night Zoom, and that really helps to build the relationship and give you the peace of mind to know that um, she's caring for herself and for your child throughout the pregnancy and can create a really nice experience when it comes to the birth as well. Um, and then afterwards, it really depends. A lot of people, um, their relationship will kind of transition to something that's more like a distant relative, you know, an aunt that you're exchanging holiday cards with and others become much closer. So it's really up to you and we encourage you to communicate your desires and preferences with your team so we can find the perfect match based on what you're looking for. Um, Dr. Shai, we probably have a minute if you want to address any kind of frequently asked questions that you get on your end too. Well, I think a lot of you might be wondering about um, how COVID has affected the egg donation and the surrogacy process. And I think it, it has had a significant impact in terms of 
the surrogate pool being more limited, um, as well as the, the timelines have been extended by a few months. And I, I think what's really wonderful about Circle is that they're based here, um, that they do um, help finding surrogates that are local for our California patients. And um, really that does help expedite the timeline quite significantly. So I would say under these current circumstances in this climate that things are taking a little bit longer than usual, um, which makes it even more important for you to find the right agency to work with. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I do think that's added a lot of um, extra stress for our parents. We also have a um, California meetup group for all of our intended parents here in the state where we get together every month now over Zoom, can bring a beverage, just kind of share your experience. And I think having that community, um, both with other circle intended parents, and I know there's so many wonderful families that are being built out of Nova IVF as well. It can be a really nice element to kind of reduce some of the stress as you're going through this. So we're always happy to introduce you to other parents in the area too. Um, I think that's about it with time. Jen, anything else you wanted to add before we wrap up? Oh, we got one question. Okay, um, what financing programs or grants are available for single people not in California? Well, you can definitely qualify for the loan as a single person that I mentioned, the $65,000 loan that we offer. Um, it's available in 15 states. And if you just wanna contact us after the webinar, we're happy to provide you with more information. Um, there's a few other programs for, um, for same-sex males and um, LGBTQ, men, there are some financial support programs through Men Having Babies. We also see a lot of intended parents just taking a home equity line of credit or getting loans from friends and family. I know it's an expensive process, but we're happy to kind of talk you through different options um, for your specific situation and help you figure it out. Um, and yes, we will be sending the recording out as well. Got another question on that. So recording will be sent and you can please contact us with any questions or if you want information on the loans as well. I think that's it. I don't know if Jen's on mute, but thank you guys so much for joining. I hope this was inf um, informative for you. We really appreciated you taking some time out of your evening and we hope to continue the conversation with you if you're interested in learning more. Yes, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Dr. Shaz. Great to see you. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.